Thank you. That concludes general questions. The next item of business is First Minister's questions. At question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The oil and gas sector is vital for the North East and the whole of Scotland. The Rosebank Energy Development will create 1,600 jobs and bring £6 billion of investment to the country. Why does John Swinney oppose that? First Minister. Well, President Officer, the issues in connection with the Rosebank oil field have been the subject of a, a very active a case that is influenced by a decision in the Supreme Court today. So um, I will need to be careful about what I say in relation to the Rosebank case. Mr Ross will acknowledge the Scottish Government believes that any new application for um, oil and gas developments has to have associated with it a very detailed and specific climate compatibility assessment undertaken to determine whether that, any such development can proceed in a fashion that is compatible with our journey to net zero. And that's the approach that the government believes should be the case. Douglas Ross. 1,600 jobs. £6 billion of investment and an SNP First Minister who cannot welcome that, who cannot support it, because the SNP oppose every single new oil and gas development in the North Sea. Oh, well, we're hearing no from Kevin Stewart. I wonder if John Swinney will be able to tell us which ones the Scottish Government support, because here's what some of John Swinney's predecessors have said. Nicola Sturgeon, who John Swinney stood side by side with for decades, said Rosebank was, in her words, the greatest act of economic vandalism in her lifetime. When the development was given the green light, Hamza Youssef said it was utterly uh, sorry, it was the wrong decision. And just last week, John Swinney, speaking about new oil and gas licenses, said the granting of them was utterly irresponsible. So why has SNP leader after SNP leader been against granting new oil and gas licences for the North Sea? First Minister. I think one of the reasons why Douglas Ross is leaving the leadership of the Conservative Party... Mr oh, Ross. Oh, so, so Mr, 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 First Mr. Minister. Mr Ross, we will not continue in such a manner. We must conduct our business in a courteous and respectful manner. First Minister. President Officer, uh, one of the reasons why I suspect Douglas Ross is leaving the leadership of the Conservative Party is that he is not presenting an accurate picture of the remarks that I have made. Yeah. Because the... Members, let's hear one another. The very specific remark that I made was that a commitment to undertake, without any scrutiny, 100 new oil and gas licences by the Prime Minister was climate denial of the first order and utterly and totally reckless. Those were my words, and I will not have them misrepresented by Douglas Ross. We've got a, a rational and considered process that we've argued for, which is that we should have that every individual application should be subject to a climate compatibility assessment because there is a journey that we have to make as a country to reach net zero. That is inescapable. Yeah. And what is clear from the position taken by the Prime Minister, supported by Douglas Ross and the Conservatives, is that they don't care about the journey yeah. on climate. Absolutely. They are not interested in the crisis that we face in the climate emergency, well, this government will take the responsible approach to managing that transition and the challenges of the climate emergency. Douglas Ross. Well, what we've just heard from John Swinney there, and his MSPs are applauding, is John Swinney and the SNP don't care about tens of thousands of jobs in the north-east of Scotland. They don't care about the oil and gas sector, which is needed now for our energy security at the moment eh, and going forward. Because when Rosebank was approved, when Cambo was improved, when any new development is approved, the SNP oppose it. They oppose new oil and gas developments. And let's hear, that was the previous First Minister's, that John Swinney didn't seem to want to hear what they'd said in his own comments that new licences were utterly irresponsible. 
Let's hear about some of his current cabinet ministers. Uh, Mary McAllen, the Energy Secretary, said this. We do not agree with the UK government issuing new oil and gas licences. I'll, I'll read it again. We do not agree with the new UK government issuing new oil and gas licences. Yeah. This is the SNP Scottish Government Energy Secretary. Uh, and I've got here a letter her predecessor wrote. Neil Gray, the former Energy Secretary, said this. He was uh, writing to climate uh, activists. We have long expressed our concern about Rosebank being given the go-ahead. And before that, we had Michael Matheson, who brought forward a consultation on a presumption against new oil and gas licences. So why does SNP Energy Secretary, after SNP Energy Secretary, oppose new oil and gas licences, which are crucial to the Scottish energy sector? First Minister. I think if Mr Ross was to look at the material the government has published and the process that we believe should be taken forward in a rational and considered way, he will find that the government's position is anchored around a number of principles. We've got to assess the compatibility of any oil and gas licence application with the journey towards net zero, and that has got to be a rigorous and thorough process that has to be undertaken. Secondly, we have got to consider issues in relation to our energy security in coming to that assessment. And thirdly, we have got to take a responsible approach to managing the transition to net zero. Now, I am not going to stand here and be lectured by a leader of the Conservative Party whose party presided over the industrial devastation of central Scotland, the consequences of which we are still having to address as a government. So this government will take the responsible approach to the management of the oil and gas sector and its transition to net zero, and we will take absolutely no lessons from the Conservatives. Douglas Ross. Singh. There is nothing, John Swinney, rational or considered about turning your back on the Scottish oil and gas sector by claiming that you are against every oil and gas licence, but being unable to say it, being unable to be truthful with the people of Scotland. The First Minister should just be honest. The SNP oppose every single new oil and gas licence being issued by the UK Government. That is the case. Because whenever a new development is proposed in the North Sea, the SNP oppose it. They oppose every round of new licences granted for the oil and gas sector. In recent years, they have not supported any new fields. Not one. Whatever John Swinney is claiming today, it's only a temporary position for the SNP. Because their position is actually very clear. They don't and will not stand up for Scotland's oil and gas industry. They are willing to put tens of thousands of jobs and the North East economy at risk. The Scottish Conservatives support Scotland's oil and gas industry. Why do the SNP oppose it? First Minister. I'm not sure Douglas Ross is on his strongest ground, taking me to task about honesty. Taking me to task about honesty. Mr Ross. Mr Ross, I would ask you to apologise for that comment. I apologise again for calling the First Minister Honest John. <laughs> Mr Ross, we are not going to continue like this and I would ask you to reflect on your conduct. First Minister. I don't think Douglas Ross is in a particularly strong position today no. to raise issues of honesty with me when the Gambling Commission is investigating the alleged conduct of senior figures, senior figures in the Conservative and Unionist Party. I think Douglas Ross is on thin ground. I also, I also, I also don't think... I also don't Mr. think... Mr. Sorry. This is actually First Minister's questions, where many members across this chamber wish to have an opportunity to put a question to the First Minister. I'd like to make sure that is possible for as many members as possible. And in order to do that, we must conduct ourselves in a courteous and respectful manner. First Minister. And I also don't think Douglas Ross is on strong ground in attacking me about the rational and considered position the Scottish Government is taking when the Prime Minister is ignoring the climate emergency by sanctioning 100 oil and gas licences without any questions being asked. 
That is irresponsible. Yes. That is the action that will accelerate the climate emergency. So this government will take the rational and considered approach to oil and gas developments. We will also support the oil and gas sector to transition to the essential work we need to undertake on renewables, because Scotland's future lies as a green energy renewables powerhouse, and the Scottish Government is putting in place the measures to make that happen. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. Presenting officer, our NHS faces a national crisis in what is known as corridor care, where patients are treated on trolleys in corridors because there simply are not enough beds in wards for them. And this week, the Royal College of Emergency Medicine published new analysis, which found that on average 45 per cent of patients treated in our emergency departments did not have access to a private cubicle. In their words, when no cubicle is available, patients are treated in other areas. Trolleys and corridors, cars, the waiting rooms, relative rooms, plaster rooms. Imagine you or one of your loved ones lying on a trolley for hours. No privacy, no dignity, just pain and distress. After 17 years of this SNP government, why has corridor care become such commonplace? First Minister. Presiding officer, as Mr Sarwar will know, uh, the issues in relation to the National Health Service are driven by, or the challenges in the National Health Service today are driven by a number of factors. One of them is the increase in demand in the aftermath of COVID, which the National Health Service is doing its level best to try to address. We are wrestling also with the challenges of our hospitals being significantly congested because of the challenges around delayed discharge, which come largely from the fact that we do not have enough social care packages available in the community because we do not have enough people in the workforce to deliver the volume of social care packages that are required. And that is a consequence of the loss of population because of the loss of free movement under Brexit. So the, the issues that we are wrestling with are significant and acute, and the government and our health boards are focused on addressing that. But finally, let me say to Mr Sawa that um, if anybody is treated in the fashion that he has uh, recounted, and I have seen media reports this morning of a particular case at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital, then I apologise unreservedly to anybody who has that experience and assure members of the public and their families that the government is doing all that it possibly can do to address that circumstance. Anna Sarwar. I have been coming to this chamber week after week for the last three years, and week after week we have been hearing apologies from SNP First Ministers, mm -hmm. and then we just get apologies the week after, and the week after nothing actually changes in terms of people's lived experience. But let us be clear, long waits cost lives. The Royal College of Emergency Medicine have warned that for every 72 patients who wait over eight hours in A&E, there will be one excess death. That is a death that could be avoided if the patient had been treated on time. That means so far this year, more than 1,000 Scots have died who could have been saved had they been treated on time. 1,000 avoidable deaths. 1,000 people so far this year alone, and it's only June, First Minister. Those are fathers and mothers, sons and daughters who died because they couldn't get their care on time. Why have these families been so badly let down by this SNP government? First Minister. In my earlier answer, I set out some of the issues that are driving this particular situation. And those issues are, to repeat them, the increase in demand after COVID, the congestion of hospitals. Hospitals are now uh, in excess of 95 per cent occupancy, which is far, far too high. It should be about 10 per cent lower than that for ordinary activity. And uh, the uh, absence of uh, uh, adequate social care capacity within the community, because we quite simply do not have enough social care workers to deliver those packages. So that is, that is the explanation of the problem. And Mr Sarwar says to me that he comes here week after week to raise these issues, and I know that he does, and he gets these answers. But what it does is it requires us to take action. So this government has taken action. This government has taken the action of increasing tax on higher earners to boost investment in the National Health Service. The National Health Service would have lower money available to it if this government had not taken the hard decisions on tax. And we have an opportunity 
as a consequence of the general election to do something about it, to encourage more people to be in the labour force, which would require us to reintroduce freedom of movement so that people could come to work in this country, or to encourage more investment uh, and to take more investment decisions, like ending austerity. And of course, what Mr Sarwar's party is, presuming, uh, is proposing is no answer on those questions. In fact, they're, pr they're proposing the reverse. They're saying we'll maintain Brexit and we'll maintain austerity. That's not good enough. It's time for the Labour Party to act. Yeah. For a politician to have been in power for 17 years, and that's the best answer he can give, I think has to take a really serious look in the mirror. And in actual fact, it was John Swinney as Finance Secretary that cut local government budgets and cut uh, social care budgets across the country. So uh, perhaps some reflection on his own record. Because the reality, presiding officer, is that patients and staff have been failed and let down by this SNP government. And a few weeks ago, the Royal College of Nursing reported on this issue as well and quoted a Scottish nurse. And let me quote that nurse. We don't complain for ourselves, but for the patient. There are no screens to go around the patient so if they are being bed bathed or need a bedpan, you have to take a patient out of their bed space and move them into a corridor. Then move the extra patient into the bed space to use the bedpan. It's time consuming, there is not enough space in the rooms and it's undignified for the patient. This is the unbearable situation that is such an unfairness to the patients and staff. So First Minister, directly to this nurse, Explain to this heartbroken nurse why you and your government continues to let them down so badly. Always through the chair, First Minister. Senator, so, I've explained what the, the challenge and the difficulty is. And the government has taken the action of increasing taxation for higher earners to invest more in the National Health Service than would have been the case had we just passed on the consequentials from UK funding. So we have taken the hard decisions. And there was, of course, a time when Mr Sarwar would have supported us, but Mr Sarwar has now U-turned on that position, and Mr Sarwar now wants to cut the money available to the public finances as a consequence of what he said. Now, now, Mr Sarwar is shaking his head at me. Mr Sarwar obviously doesn't, no, Mr. Sarwar obviously doesn't understand what he was saying at his press conference on Tuesday, because what the consequences of his stance will be to reduce yeah. public expenditure in Scotland. Yeah. So it is quite simply beyond credibility yeah. to come here and ask me to invest more money yeah. in the National Health Service to tackle the issues that Mr Sawar is concerned about when he wants to cut public expenditure yeah. and his, in any prospective incoming United Kingdom government will also be cutting public expenditure. So my answer to that nurse is that we've got to have an end to austerity and she won't get it from the Labour government. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In precisely that vein, this week the First Minister tried to present the SNP as the only party committed to ending the cuts and reversing austerity. But apart from changes to income tax, which have already been done in Scotland thanks to pressure from the Greens, the only actual change he proposed was to devolve taxes, not increase them. Now, Scotland should have control over oil and gas windfall taxes, other corporate taxes, national insurance, fuel duty or VAT, but only if we actually use those powers to raise revenue. Uh, and only, the only change that the First Minister proposed was actually a VAT cut. So does he agree with the Greens that reversing the cuts and providing the investment that the country so clearly needs can only be done by raising significant revenue from those super rich who are hoarding the country's wealth? First Minister. There's two aspects to answering that question. The first is the actions of the Scottish Government. And in terms of the actions of the Scottish Government, we have, Mr Harvey will be familiar with these points, we have taken a range of decisions to, uh, to vary the tax position in Scotland and in some circumstances to ask uh, higher earners to pay more in taxation where it is appropriate for that uh, to be undertaken. So the Government will, uh, has set out its position and its uh, fiscal approach to enable that to be the case. There is then the debate about the forthcoming United Kingdom election. And of course, 
Uh, I set out my party's position yesterday. I, 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 if the presiding officer will forgive me, um, I, I would refer uh, Mr Harvey to the contents of our manifesto, which set out a number of tax changes and spending changes that we would make to enable the priorities that we set out to be afforded within the financial envelope available to us. Thank you. Before I call Mr Harvey, I would remind members that the Chamber is not the place to campaign for a UK general election. Patrick Harvey. Uh, indeed, Presiding Officer. And the First Minister is right about the additional revenue from income tax as a result of the work the Greens did to show how that could be done. But he presented no plans for a wealth tax. No plans at all for a wealth tax. But as I say, the Greens did work out the detail on progressive income tax for Scotland. So maybe the First Minister is relying on us once again to do the work for him. And he supports our proposals for a wealth tax on the richest 1% which would raise at least 70 billion. But the real problem for him as First Minister is that whoever forms the next UK government, they are still committed to Tory fiscal rules. And they refuse to rejoin the EU as well, so cutting off both sources of extra revenue that he's relying on. So when a new Labour Chancellor inevitably imposes more austerity to keep their new billionaire backers happy, what will the First Minister do with the taxes he does control? Will he go further to raise the funds that we need to stop more cuts in Scotland? And will he finally scrap the broken council tax system to let our councils raise the revenue they need to protect their services? First Minister. Uh, there's obviously a lot of fiscal choices involved in the question that Mr Harvey puts to me. And Mr Harvey knows me well enough to know that uh, the, the budget doesn't get written from here on a Thursday afternoon uh, randomly in question time. There will be a process of engagement across the uh, parliamentary spectrum to enable that to be undertaken. Where I do agree with Mr Harvey, however, is that the conspiracy of silence that exists between the Conservative Party and the Labour Party of hiding the £18 billion worth of cuts from the public is absolutely reprehensible. Because the one thing that's got to happen in the election that we are facing just now, there must be an end to austerity. Yeah, yeah. Our public services cannot cope with any more austerity. And unfortunately, the outcome of the United Kingdom general election, the election of either a Conservative or a Labour government, is going to deliver more austerity. And that's why we need to use our votes effectively to stop that in the election. Question number four, Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on the call from the Federation of Small Business Scotland for the next UK administration to pilot a remote visa to benefit remote areas such as the Highlands, in line with the Migration Advisory Committee recommendation and what the implications of this could have for Scotland's economy. First Minister. President Officer, the UK Government's own Migration Advisory Committee described our rural visa pilot proposal as, and I quote, sensible and clear in both scale and deliverability, and highlighted that it's in the UK Government's own interest to trial it. Despite this and the harm caused to our rural and island communities by a hard Brexit, the current United Kingdom Government refused to engage. The business sector recognises these harms. It is therefore welcome that FSB Scotland is calling for a rural visa pilot recognising businesses need to attract people to Scotland to contribute to our economy and communities. Our offer to the next United Kingdom Government is simple. Work with us and stakeholders across Scotland who are calling in the strongest terms possible for this pilot to be delivered. Claire Adamson. Thank you. Thank the First Minister for his answer. Um, Scotland's rural communities often face economic challenges for a range of reasons, and this has been exacerbated by a hard Tory Brexit. What is the First Minister's latest assessment on the impact of Brexit on the population of rural Scotland and the ability for businesses facing acute workforce shortages across Scotland to attract new employees and what is his response to the rejection of the Commission's offer of youth mobility for under 30s? First Minister. Uh, President Officer, the, the issues that Claire Addison puts to me are very real issues. Uh, I spent uh, several days um, over the weekend and at the start of this week in um, the North East, uh, the Highlands, the North West of Scotland and in our islands in the West Coast. And everywhere I went, I was hearing about the challenges of availability of population, which is at the heart of the question that Claire Addison puts to me. 
The um, initiative that the Commission took for a youth mobility scheme, in my view, is welcome. It fits compatibly with the Government's openness towards uh, freedom of movement for individuals. So I do, uh, you know, obviously it's a matter of record that these issues have been resisted by the current United Kingdom Government. I hope there is, after the election, some opportunity to advance these issues, which um, I will uh, constructively take forward with an incoming United Kingdom Government. That's my intention to, to, to engage constructively on some of these questions so we can find practical solutions to the issues that have been put to me by businesses. Because if we look to the point that Mr Sawa raised with me about the health service, one of the areas with the strongest, cha greatest challenge in relation to dis delayed discharge is the Highlands, and that is about the availability of population within the communities to deliver social care. So the issues that Claire Anderson puts to me are very, very important, and the Government will engage constructively to try to resolve them with an incoming United Kingdom Government. Question number five, Graeme Simpson. Thank you. To ask the First Minister what his response is to the reported comment from the Nuclear Industry Association that his stance on nuclear power is hopelessly ideological and anti-science. First Minister. President, officer, the Scottish Government does not support the building of new nuclear power stations in Scotland. Uh, we have abundant natural resources and a highly skilled workforce to take advantage of the many renewable energy opportunities. Evidence shows that new nuclear is more expensive than renewable alternatives. Nuclear energy also creates radioactive waste, which must be safely managed over many decades to protect the environment, requiring complex and expensive handling. Yeah. The Scottish Government is supporting continued growth in renewables, storage, hydrogen and carbon capture technologies to drive economic growth, support green jobs and provide secure, affordable and clean energy for Scotland. Graham yeah. Simpson. So it is hopelessly ideological and anti-science. Now, wind is only available 45% of the time. It requires backup from gas uh, compared to nuclear, which is available 90% of the time and is therefore far more reliable. The First Minister's anti-nuclear energy sense has seen gas consumption double since 2015. So I think we're, we have to assume that he wants to follow the example of Germany, Austria and Belgium who have seen carbon emissions rise after decommissioning nuclear plants. Now, we know the GMB Congress last week called for the Scottish Government to lift the ban. They've now invited Kate Forbes to meet nuclear workers at Hunterston. Will she go? First Minister. President, so I, I, I gave a considered answer to Graham Simpson. I don't think it could in any way be described as ideological because I made the point that evidence shows that new nuclear is more expensive than renewable alternatives. Yeah. We're, facing, we're facing a cost of living and public finance crisis. So any responsible First Minister will look to make sure that we make the most fiscally efficient approach to energy generation. Now, this government, as a result of its clear policy leadership, has successfully decarbonised electricity generation within Scotland. Yeah. We've uh, developed renewable energy with policy certainty. And I want to give the same policy certainty to storage, to hydrogen, to carbon capture technologies to drive economic growth and support green jobs. What troubles me is that we've got fabulous projects in Scotland, for example, in carbon capture and technology, the ACON project, for example, and we have been led up the garden path by the Treasury and by UK ministers. I've lost count of the number of times when I was a senior minister, where I was promised face to face by UK ministers an acceleration of the ACON project, and it hasn't happened. So I'm afraid to say Graham Simpson hasn't got a leg to stand on on this question. We've got a clear strategy on renewables. We will pursue that, and we'll pursue it sustainably to deliver for the people of Scotland. Thank you, Dunbar. I fully support the First Minister on his stance regarding nuclear power. So can I ask the First Minister if any MSPs have ever written to the Scottish Government to propose or support nuclear power stations to be built within their own communities and areas that they represent? First Minister. 
I, I, I'm not personally aware of any of that correspondence, presiding officer, but I think what's important is that we have a very clear strategy for the generation of electricity in our country and the government is giving that policy certainty and I want to make sure that policy certainty is widely understood within Scotland. Question number six, Neil Bibby. To ask the uh, First Minister what assurances the Scottish Government can provide to the arts and culture sector to ensure confidence in light of the reported issues with the sponsorship of cultural events. First Minister. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government recognises the valuable role that corporate and philanthropic giving plays in supporting the culture sector and we are committed to working with all interested parties to help restore the confidence that has been damaged in, that has been damaged in light of recent events. The Scottish Government has publicly called for dialogue and, crucially, we have highlighted the damage that disinvestment campaigns are doing to fundamentally undermine the sector and our world-class festivals, a number of which continue to receive significant amounts of public funding. Indeed, Scottish Government funding to the culture sector is increasing by £15.8 million in this financial year to £196.6 million. And we have also recently reaffirmed our commitment to investing at least £100 million more annually in culture and arts by the financial year 2008-29. Neil Bibby. I th thank the First Minister for that answer. Many figures in Scotland's culture sector are warning the scale of their funding crisis cannot be overstated. There is a real need to shore up confidence in supporting cultural organisations. They should be targets for investment, not disinvestment. I back calls from the sector for the government to hold a festivals funding summit back in April, but the government uh, rejected this proposal. This position is surely now unsustainable. Can I ask the First Minister, therefore, will he, whether he will now convene an urgent meeting of private and philanthropic supporters to ensure there is ongoing sponsorship of the arts and culture sector in Scotland? First Minister. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to engage on the point that Mr Bibby has raised, and I welcome his question to me today, because it provides me with the opportunity to say a little bit more about this issue. Um, I've personally been deeply concerned by the events that have taken place and I have personally spoken with the leadership of Bailey Gifford because I am concerned about the targeting of that organisation because I welcome the support that they provide in a philanthropic way to many organisations. So, um, and, and I've reassured the company of the importance that I attach to their contribution to the economy. I think the, dis the disinvestment campaigns are misplaced. Uh, I don't think they achieve their objectives. They are now jeopardising really important cultural festivals that I know Mr Bibby and I value equally. So I will take away his proposal. To, uh, I said in my original answer that the government has publicly uh, in, uh, called for dialogue. Um, Angus Robertson, the Culture Secretary, has been engaging heavily on this question with a number of interested parties. But if there is a further more formal dialogue that is required, uh, I will consider that proposal uh, and, uh, and reply to Mr Bibby. Thank you. Move to general and constituency supplementaries, and I call Christine Graham. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. First Minister, the Cabinet Secretary is aware that there are concerns of cuts to both GP practices in Pennycook to their services due in part, they state, to NHS Lothian increasing rental costs. And as you will imagine, I've had many emails on this from concerned constituents. Given that there is a substantial increase in house build and therefore population in Pennycook and surrounding area, will NHS Lothian have taken this into account? First Minister. I will have to explore that particular point to determine if that analysis has been undertaken, but I do understand the challenge that Christine Graham raises with me about the sharp rise in population in the Pennycook area. It will be part of the sharp rise in population in general in the south-east of Scotland, and particularly in mid West, Mid and East Lothian uh, which is, uh, and the City of Edinburgh, which is particularly acute. And that will place a strain on public infrastructure such as GP surgeries. Uh, the, health, the, the, the issues in relation to premises charges and utilisation costs uh, are a matter for uh, negotiation between GP practices and health boards, but I will take away the specific point that Christine Graham puts to me uh, to determine what analysis has been put in place to address this issue. Aaron Dowie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The SNP awarded funding to River Garden, a rehabilitation centre in Auchincroof, to help 56 people recover from drug addiction, but their funding has been paused. The financial constraints mean they can currently only accommodate six people. The future of the facility is now at risk, with fear that it may close within weeks. Scotland has the worst drug death rate in Europe, 
but beds are lying empty because funding has been frozen. Will the First Minister look at this immediately and sort this out? First Minister. I, I will take away that specific. It's a, it's a very specific issue, so I, I, I can't give uh, Sharon Dowie a, a direct question, a, a direct response today. But I will take it away and explore it. We have, we are undertaking. I think I answered a question from Mr. Green a few weeks ago, which indicated that we were on target to increase the number of beds that are available for. Um, rehabilitation, rehabilitation services according to the expectations of the national mission. So I'm surprised to hear the information that Sharon Bowie um, uh, puts to Parliament today, given the fact that my expectation is that we will achieve our um, published targets. But I will take away that particular issue and explore the issues in relation to River Garden. Thank you, Bailey. Presiding officer, across Scotland, the NHS and social care partnerships are facing a combined budget gap of almost £1.4 billion. That means severe cuts to social care services. In Glasgow, that will lead to cuts to community health services, cuts to the discharge and resettlement teams, cuts to care home nursing teams, the loss of 72 staff posts, health visitors, nurses, allied health professionals and complex needs workers. Can the First Minister tell me why, if we all agree that we need to increase support for primary care, his government is doing the exact opposite in Glasgow and cutting social services and staff? First Minister. Well, this is, this is, this is courageous questioning from Jackie Bailey. Um, I think Jackie Bailey has to... I've been trying to set out to Parliament for some considerable time the enormous pressure that there is on public finances. This... Well, if Jackie Bailey would stop interrupting me, we might make a little bit more progress. So, the, we face a public spending crisis in Scotland, and what the Labour Party is proposing is to continue that austerity. That is what, that is, what is being proposed. So... We've taken, we've taken the hard decisions in this, in this government to increase the resources that are available for investment in the public services. We've asked people on higher earnings to contribute more in taxation to enable us to invest more in the health service and in social care. That's what we have done. Jackie Bailey opposed that. Jackie Bailey opposed that. She opposed every single bit of it. And now there's an opportunity on the 4th of July to elect a government that could end austerity. And no, the Labour Party is not seizing the opportunity to end austerity. The Labour Party is going to prolong austerity. So I gently suggest to Jackie Bailey it would help the situation if the Labour Party committed itself to end austerity, supported this government and its agenda, and we could address the issues that Jackie Bailey is raising with me. Evelyn Tweed. Analysis by the Nuffield Trust has indicated that both Labour and the Tories' plans for the NHS would leave the health service with lower spending increases than during the years of Tory austerity. Yeah. Does the First Minister agree with me that we should be prioritising additional investment in our NHS, not cutting it? First Minister. President Officer, um, I, I, I was, as Evelyn Tweed was uh, making her setting out her question, um, the source of her information, the Nuffield Trust, was being criticised within this Parliament. But I think it's important that we all recognise the source of the information that Evelyn Tweed was putting on the record is a much respected health commenting yeah. organisation, the Nuffield Trust. Yeah. And they've indicated that the proposals in the Labour and Conservative manifestos will result in lower increases in health spending than in the worst years of Conservative austerity. Yep. That is a missed opportunity to address the very issues that Jackie Bailey and Anna Sawar have put to me exactly. today. 100%. So we've got to ensure that we have a realistic debate about investment in the health service. This government has taken the hard decisions to increase tax on higher earners so we could invest more in the National Health Service. I wish other people would follow the example that we've taken about investment in the health service. Absolutely. Very grateful, Presiding Officer. Last week, the Courier reported, and this is a, a direct quote, a new parole hearing date has been confirmed for Angus Killer Tasmin Glass as she seeks release from prison 
after serving only half her 10-year sentence. Her case will now be considered by the Parole Board for the third time on July 26, the day before a memorial motorbike ride in honour of her victim, Stephen Donaldson. A family spokesperson said, the Parole Board has kept us waiting since February, and with the Scottish Parole Board deferring the decision twice already, it has been a long and difficult wait for us. The timing of the parole hearing is difficult for us." End quote. First Minister, the Courier's Voice for Victims campaign considers the parole system re-traumatises victims and needs greater transparency and communication between those involved. Does the First Minister agree? And if so, what will he do about it? First Minister. The first thing I would say is to express my sympathy to the, uh, to the family that is involved in this case, uh, to the Donaldson family. I, I am familiar with this case, uh, given my uh, adjacent representation to the areas affected. Uh, and obviously, as Mr Kerr will know, the decisions that are taken by the Parole Board are um, for the Parole Board and they are independent of government, and uh, he would not expect me to comment on the substance of them. Where I accept the point that Mr Kerr is making is that all aspects of our justice system must be trauma-informed. And I, I, before my election as First Minister, I sat with uh, colleagues on the Criminal Justice Committee hearing evidence about the Victims and Witnesses Bill, which legislates in favour of trauma-informed practice in the justice system. So I am very sympathetic to the importance of that point in every respect. And all aspects of the justice system have to be trauma-informed. So there, there, obviously there is a range of measures that are in place already. Uh, the legislation prompts us to reconsider and review whether they are all sufficient to address these challenges and these questions. And I give Mr Kerr the commitment that the Government will do that as we explore the passage of that Bill and determine whether there's any additional provisions are required to address the legitimate point that he puts to me. Faisal Chowdhury. Thank you, Presiding Officer. A constituent in Lothian has been diagnosed with prostate cancer and told that his tumour is growing. He is on an eight-month waiting list for surgery and has no idea when treatment will start. Public Health Scotland found only 36.4% of patients with prostate cancer received treatment within the government's target of 62 days, the lowest of any major cancer type. Can the First Minister advise how the Scottish Government is working to bring down these unacceptable waiting times? First Minister. First, first of all, I am sorry that Mr Chowdhury's constituent is facing the anxiety that they are facing, um, and if he wishes to share details with me, I will have the case examined to see if there is anything that can be done to address this particular case. The Government has invested um, £70 million in the endoscopy and urology diagnostic plan, which includes a commitment to develop urology diagnostic hubs which are designed to speed up the treatment of cases of the type that Mr Chowdhury puts to me so that we can detect cancer earlier and faster and then obviously intervene at the earliest possible stage, which is crucial in cancer care. So um, I assure Mr Chowdhury of the importance the Government attaches to this important area of health service policy, but if he cares to advise me about the individual case, I will see what can be done to uh, address the issues he puts to me. Macdonald. Thank you, President Officer. The latest PMI report from the Royal Bank of Scotland has shown that Scotland was a standout performer among the UK nations and regions last month, with private sector economic growth accelerating to the fastest pace in two years. What assessment has the First Minister and the Scottish Government made of these findings, and what steps are the Scottish Government taking to continue to help our economy to thrive? First Minister. President Officer, I very much welcome the findings from this report, which signals uh, a strengthening of private sector activity in Scotland, um, which uh, confirms that that activity has expanded for the fifth month running and at the strongest pace in two years. Uh, as Parliament will know, one of the four priorities of the Government is to strengthen the economy, and the Deputy First Minister is leading work in uh, my support to advance uh, these issues within government. Some of the measures that we are taking uh, are to build on the good work that has been done about encouraging the start-up community, 
with now further investment in the scale-up community, and we are seeing some of the fruits of that in the success of business, which is underpinning the, uh, the, the very positive information that came from the, uh, the purchaser man Purchasing Managers Index. And I assure Mr Macdonald of the continued focus of the Government on ensuring we strengthen economic growth and economic activity, because that is the foundation of good and strong public services in our country. Paul Sweeney. Thank you, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, the First Minister has said that his biggest priority in government is to eradicate child poverty, yet this morning councillors, SNP councillors and Green councillors in Glasgow voted to cut the celebrated MCR Pathways scheme by 50 per cent. Celebrated High Court Judge Rita Reyes said this will be a disaster, it will bring people into the criminal justice system. The former Director of Education in Glasgow, Maureen McKenna, has said it is inexplicable Members of my own family take part in the MCR Pathways Scheme. It is one of the genuinely best measures we have ever developed to improve the lives of young people, get them out of harm's way, get them into opportunities, life-changing opportunities. Surely the First Minister agrees this is a regressive retrograde step. Will he do something yeah. to ensure that the MCR Pathways Scheme is not cut but expanded? It is one of the most successful public policies we have. First Minister. I'm I, I'm very familiar with the work of MCR Pathways. Uh, I supported its introduction into public policy when I was the Education Secretary, and I recognise the transformative effect it can have on young people. Uh, obviously, decisions about uh, the particular allocation of funding are matters for individual local authorities. The Government has, of course, uh, given local government um, a record funding settlement of over £14 billion for this financial year, and that will have been allocated uh, proportionately to Glasgow City Council. And, uh, I would uh, obviously uh, encourage members to look carefully and seriously at the work of MCR Pathways, recognising the benefits it can deliver for young people around the country. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. The next item of business is a member's debate in the name of Jamie Green, and there will be a short suspension now to allow those leaving the chamber and gallery to do so before that item of business begins.